Can you believe it? We're there. It's a warm day. Excited to be in church. I believe God's got something good for us. We're in a series called the Book of John. We're in, and that be, that's because we are in the Book of John. <laughs> really creative and uh, and cryptic. Um, but we want to make sure that uh, we are sharing things with you and, and going through the Word and just laying some things out and um, and letting God speak to our hearts. Amen. And I don't always teach like this. Uh, this is like a, a, an expository, like going in and, and kind of breaking down Scripture. And um, I'm usually in series. God usually has us in series to touch on subjects and, and see it from a wide variety of Scriptures. But just felt prompted to kind of pick up where I'd left off a couple of years ago in the book of John and, uh, and go through some chapters as long as, as long as he sees fit to go through it. And, and we'll change when he says change. So right now we're in the book of John. So turn with me to John chapter 14. And uh, I'll say this for maybe a few of you that might have not been in the loop as of last week, um, but we did have a video and made a, a pretty big announcement for our church uh, that we have purchased six acres of land. <laughs> Amen. And so uh, we're, in a, we're in a believe and build uh, season right now where we're believing God for big things, and, uh, and he's doing it. He's, he's showing up. And so... Um, you know, we can only be in this space for so long until we need more space. And right now, we need more space. And, uh, and God's providing that for us. So we're moving forward. So just stay hooked up with us and stay believing. God's doing awesome things in our lives for our church in this community. Because it's not about us. It's about Jesus and Jesus being preached. Yes? And, uh, and I believe we can do that with a better and bigger facility and just keep on going. And I know you do too. So it'll be awesome. Amen. Thank you, Lord. John chapter 14 is our anchor verse. You can highlight, underline, circle, star it, point arrows to it. It's a good thing to read and understand. John chapter 14, verse 21. And I'm going to read this one in the Amplified. Uh, just so you know where it's at in your Bible, you can highlight it. But I'm going to read this one in the Amplified. And it says this, The person who has my commands and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And whoever really loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love him and will show, reveal, and manifest myself to him. I will let myself be clearly seen by him and make myself real to him. This is Jesus' a words to us that he wants to reveal himself more and more to us as we follow after him. And really, that's the only way to do it. That's really the only way to see more of him is to do what he said. I don't know if you know this or not, but <clears throat> the Lord will give us instructions. He will give us um, sometimes rebuke, correction, He'll ask us to do things. He'll give us a, a command or something he wants us to obey. And if we refuse to obey him in some areas in our life that we know he's spoken to us about and we won't do it, we will stagnate in our walk with the Lord in that spot right there. You, you can plateau. You can't move beyond where, what he's asked you to do until you've done what he's asked you to do. Yes? And so there are things we know this in the natural. That there are steps we take in any job, in any relationship, in life, that if you don't, if you don't master this one, you're not going on to this one, right? Uh, how many of your kids, when they first learned to get mobile, jumped up and ran across the room, right? It's not how it works, right? We, they start figuring out the, the arms and legs motion on the ground. Some of y'all kids kind of watch that and then they skip to the, the staggering, but no, none of them, none of them jump into running, right? There's a step, there's a process. So he's asking us to follow after him. And if we want to know more of him, we want to see more of him, we're going to have to obey him. We're going to have to start with the things that we don't seem to think are significant and yet they are those little things are very important to obey god in because he wants to reveal himself even more to us amen did that hit home some of you are like gosh two minutes in preacher you're already messing in my mail <laughs> poking in my business yep that's how it goes amen last week we were uh, talking about john chapter 12 and we saw um we saw mary bring anointing oil and anoint jesus and, and dry his feet with her hair. And we saw a response uh, from Judas over that gift that was seemingly religious. And yet it was anything but religious. It was just carnal. And so we're, we're gonna, today we're going to look at a little bit more of that just to, to expound a little bit on Judas's reaction. But we saw that there was, there was an expression of love toward Jesus that, that Mary had prepared this gift for him. For a while, and then there was a, a reaction from the outside of, oh, we could have we could have used that expensive perfume. We could have sold it. We could have given that money to the poor. Two different reactions for what had happened. 
the thief was looking to steal, and Mary's heart was to just bless Jesus. You know, it's important that we recognize when people get blessed around us, things that happen to them that are good, that are, that are, that are God-given, that we need to be more concerned about the person than the gift itself. Can I give you an example? Thanks. Um, <laughs> so here's the example. I'm giving it to you anyway. Me and Beth, we're going. I heard, a, I heard a story one time where th- there was a meeting going on, a minister's meeting going on, and um, a particular man was impressed by the Lord to give a minister a watch, and it wasn't a cheap one. It was an expensive watch, a very expensive watch. But he was being led of the Lord to do this, to bless, to honor. And so he gave him this watch. It was a Rolex. Gave him this watch. And the minister was super grateful, super grateful. But in the same meeting, there was this rumbling, right? Little conversations happening after this, after this gift of, oh, man, that's too extravagant. He shouldn't have, he shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have given that to that minister. We could have sold that, and we could have given that to charity. When people say that and they're Christians, who are they quoting? Do you want to be the person that quotes Judas? Are those your favorite verses? See, what happens is, is that we as Christians, we're like, hey, if, if, if people that are Christians have too much money, then they're really not living godly because they should be using all their wealth to just give them to the kingdom and live like paupers. Who are you quoting when you think like that? Come on now. It, it's, it's, it's looking at the money and the gift with a higher priority than the person that God was trying to bless. Does God want to bless his kids? I mean, we see it all throughout the Bible. People got blessed, and I don't mean little, I mean big blessings from God when they honored God and they were standing and I'm telling you those people that got blessed they stood in a place of sacrifice for a while they laid down a lot of stuff they gave up stuff that others weren't willing to give up to honor God and God said he promises in a word if you lay down that stuff for my sake in this life in this life you'll reap reward if you give up houses and buildings and land you give up relationships for the sake of the gospel in this life there's reward for that and so you got people going, wait, 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 that reward's too big. That's too, that, mm, that just screams of, of just affluence and opulence. It just, oh, it's icky. No, 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 it's God. God's got all kinds of resources. Now, you can get it the wrong way or you can get it the God way. Which way do you want to get it? Because he says he'll make you rich and he'll add no sorrow with it. Well, what does that mean? That means you got some stuff, but there's no sorrow because you got it because you did it the right way. Amen. So we got to make sure we're not quoting Judas when we see somebody else get blessed. God do something for them. We got to love them enough to honor them. Go, thank you, Lord, for blessing them. I am so glad you honored them and that they were honored by this gift and this, their sacrifice. God, I just I care so much that they were happy about that gift. That's exciting. I mean, can you imagine? They drove that away. They wore that out of the place. They they're living in that today. That's a testimony to God's goodness. Not to go, man, you should sell that. You could live in a way smaller house. You could give all that extra to the, mo- to the poor, right? The same people saying that are not selling all their stuff and giving it to the poor. So we got to be careful who we're quoting, amen? And make sure that when people get blessed, that our heart is right before God. Because God's not, he's not cheap, and he's not short on resources. He could, he could get everybody a brand new house, and everybody a car, and everybody a brand new watch. He could, and then still not break the bank. Are you hearing me? So we're not pursuing those things, but when God wants to bless you, just receive it and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And when others get it, say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for blessing them. If you'll do it for them, I know you'll do it for me. And I'm going to keep honoring you and obeying and following you. And, and he'll bless you. He'll bless you. It's in the book. It's all over the place. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Let's turn to John chapter 13. <clears throat> John chapter 13. We'll begin reading a little bit, and I'll just... Make some points as we go. Can we do that? John chapter 13. Is that okay? Can we do that? Okay, good. John chapter 13, verse 1. We're going to start right there. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, let's just stay there for a second. The Bible says that Jesus knew his hour had come. He knew it. How did he know that? Was he using some super spiritual 
connection with God to know this? Or was he tapped into the Holy Spirit just like we are? Come on, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit to be led by the Holy Spirit so that we could do the same things Jesus did. He operated like us by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we could walk like him when we were here. That's why he said, greater things will you do than I did because I go to the Father. How could he say that if he did everything as God and didn't operate as a man through the Holy Spirit? Are you following me? So because of this, he's, he's come to a place where he says, I, Jesus knew his hour. He knew his time had come. So let me ask you this. Who's ever taught you as a Christian that you can know when your time has come? Is it possible for you to know if your time has come or not? Listen, I, I'm not one of those people that preach this, and I don't see it in the Word of God, where people say, you know, when your time's up, it's just up. There's nothing you can do about it. You might be five, you might be 15, you might be 42, you might be 87, you might be 124. It's just all set. There's nothing you can do about it. I don't see that in Scripture. I see promises in the Word of God that if you honor your father and mother, you'll live a long life. That's to everybody that will honor. So how do you, how do you start cutting people out? Now, then people are like, well, what about martyrs? Martyrs, are, they're, in, they're, they're promised in here too. But most people that are dying, young, are not dying for their faith at the hands of somebody trying to get them to relinquish their relationship with Jesus. Are you following me? I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm not saying God doesn't love people. I'm just saying there's promises in the word to live a long life. And he will talk to us and he will equip us and he will lead us so that you're not in the wrong place at the wrong time where you should have never been. Come on, I mean, all of us are running through scenarios right now of people that we've known that have died young, have died at the wrong, you know, it seems like, man, this is a terrible time for people to die. And Christians say, it was just his time. God just had to take him. And none of those cliches are happy or helpful to anybody that's grieving. It's quiet in this church. I believe God lays out a time for us to live on this earth. And that he says, if you'll have a long life, that's longer than seven years old. That's longer than 42. Long life. When you think of long life, right? When you think about how long am I going to live, you're going to live to a ripe old age, right? And maybe die in your sleep and just go home to be with Jesus. Doesn't that just sound nice? I mean, you don't have to die of cancer or an accident or something bad happening to you. That's not how you have to die. We accept those outcomes because we just... Turn our eyes to him. He's going over big. <laughs> Listen, we got to start thinking right so we can live the fullness of what God has given to us because we have a job to do. And you dying early short circuits what God wants to do through you. Now, you do have free will. We can choose things that aren't of God. We can choose to do all the drugs and smoke all the crack and drink all the stuff and shorten our lives. And then he can save us from all of that and heal our bodies completely and we can still live a long life. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. I needed a few more amens on that one. Because he's the restorer. He's the healer, right? But I mean, there are Christians that are just accepting the fate of what the world says and what the doctor says and what, and, and they're just, you know, it's just, it just must be my time. No. We're supposed to fight some of these things. We're supposed to be hit, led by the Holy Spirit and when he's telling you to take a different route home, you listen. You avoid a trap set up for you to cause you problems and hurt. We got to get to that place where we hear good. Amen? So Jesus got to a place where he knew that the hour he was going to step out of this life. He had a mission. He had a, he had a absolute purpose. He died at the right time. People say, well, then maybe we should all die at 33. No. That's his call, his mission. Are you following me? He died for the sins of the whole world. So unless you're dying for the sins of the whole world, you're not supposed to go at 33. Are you following me? Come on, we're supposed to age and, and become parents and grandparents and pass down to generations the goodness of God in us and what we've learned and acquired and, and put that into the next generation. And generations, are you following? I heard a, a, a preacher one time, he was talking about his aunt pillar in the church, loved God, served all the time, prayed in the Holy Ghost, man, she just loved God, she did so much for the kingdom, and just a humble, lovely woman, 
and then she got a diagnosis. You got cancer, it's aggressive, you don't have long to live, get your affairs in order. And so she started to put her affairs in order. But this pastor, her, her, her nephew said, well, wait a minute, let's, maybe I can go there, we can talk, we can talk some, talk some word to her, you know, get her, get this thing turned around. So he, he brought the Bible in, let's read the Bible. He started reading the healing scriptures, and he started reading the, that Jesus, you know, wore stripes on his back, by stripes we are healed, and healing is the children's bread out of John 15, and, and just laying some stuff out. And she just heard it, but she was just like, that's, that's good, that's good, I'm tired, I, I need, I need some rest. Just wasn't resonating. It's like you're hitting a brick wall. You guys ever give somebody scripture and it felt like you're just hitting a brick wall? Come on now. You got to find which way to get in there. You got to find out which way the Holy Spirit needs to get in there. This is, a, this is a believer, somebody loves God. Just getting ready to die because the doctor said. So we prayed about it. Came back the next day, got, got, some, got a word from the Lord. Read her this scripture. With long life, I will satisfy you and show you the reward of my salvation. He says, have you lived long enough? Is, do you have more to do? Is there, is there more things on your heart to do in this life to be a blessing in the kingdom? And she said, yeah. You know, there are some things that, that are still on my heart that I want to accomplish, that I haven't done yet, that I'm working on. There are some things. He says, well, do you feel like you've lived long enough? I mean, she's in her late 60s. Do you feel like you've been long, lived long enough? She said, no. No, actually not. He says, well, this says that with long life, I will satisfy you. So are you satisfied? She says, I'm not satisfied. He said, well, there we go. And the light came on. The light came on, right? And so they prayed and they believed God. And he let, when he came back, she wasn't just bedridden laying down. She was sitting up and talking, right? And then two, three days later, she's out of the hospital. And on Sunday, she's in church testifying of the goodness of God. Cancer free, amen? It matters what we believe. As Christians, we cannot think like the world. You don't have a set time where you're just going to die at some young age. The enemy's trying to get you. He walks about seeking whom he may devour. Amen? We just got to take ourselves out that playing field. He ain't going to devour me. I know who I am. Amen? With long life, he will satisfy me and show me the great salvation of the Lord. Amen? Great and mighty things. And I'm not satisfied yet, so I'm just going to keep on going. Yes? So that means that if you live long enough, you can know the hour of your departure. You can know the time of when you're going to go. You can just sense it in your spirit. What would that be like? How many people do you know personally that knew that? I only have a couple. Most people just take whatever's told them and just check out. You don't have to die sick, injured, hurt from accident. You can die at a ripe old age. Fulfilled everything God called you to do, satisfied, see the goodness of God in the land of the living, and just go on home. How's that sound? A little bit better, isn't it? Sounds good to me. Amen? That's verse 1. Jesus knew. He knew by the Spirit when his hours come. Come on, let's just listen to the Holy Spirit and have him lead us all the time. I mean, you know, I don't think you should start asking him right now when you're going to die. That's just not a good idea. But ask him what you should be doing right now. What you should be doing. He'll lead you. <laughs> he loved his disciples to the very end. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus is, is showing us what it looks like to be a leader and to be a servant. Jesus is the son of God. We're sons and daughters of God. We are. He's the son of God, the only begotten of the Father. Come on, all power, all might, all dominion is in his hand. He's given it to the church. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God. This is Jesus, right? He, he was maker of heavens and earth. He's the word and the word became flesh. He girds himself with a towel, gets down with a wash basin, and he's washing his disciples' feet. Come on, this is an absolute depiction of how we're to view each other. We are not stepping stones to each other's success. Well, we're to serve one another. We're to love one another. 
We're to care for one another. Come on, that comes from service. Are you hearing me? That's why many of you guys are involved in church and in the service of church. That's why we do these things. We're not doing this, uh, you know, to, to get some gold star on the chart in heaven. We're doing this because we're serving each other. We're working in kids because there are parents that need to come in here and drop their kids off so they can hear God talk to their heart while they're in here. Come on, there's kids back there that need to know that they can talk to God when they're six, seven, eight years old and hear from them, amen, and, and then make their lives, you know, follow him on the straight path and not get off course. I mean, there are, there are so many statistics just naturally speaking about church that make incredible impacts in families. It's not even... It's not even close to anything else. When you take church families that are in church on a regular basis and their kids are hearing about Jesus and hearing about the Holy Spirit, their life impact, when they watch it course through life, is far better than if they hadn't gone to church at all. You start compounding that when dad's at home leading by example, by godly, and mom's at home leading godly by example. Come on, when you're the same in church and you're the same at home, it just gets better and better and better. Church does make an impact. And this is why we come together, because we love each other. It's our family. First and second service. We're not at odds with one another. We just love each other. Amen? So Jesus has shown us what it looks like. We serve each other. We show up to serve. We show up to serve, to help people. We love people. That's what we want. God's going to get us what we need. But we show up to serve too, amen? Amen? See, washing your feet's a big deal in this, in this culture. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Peter answered and said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. The thing I like about Peter is he's, he's pretty out front. You know, he says what, he, he says what he's thinking. He's like, I, I, I don't even, I, the idea is, is, is it seems good. It seems religious. Lord, let me serve you. You're master. You're Messiah. You're, I can't have you wash my feet. It seems noble and humble, right? And Jesus says, if you don't let me do this, you have no part with me. And immediately, that's what I love about Peter, immediately he, he switches. Lord, forgive me. He makes it. That's, this is a repentant statement. Not my feet only, but also my hands. Right? I mean, wa- wash me all. Are, are you seeing this? There's things about being a, a, a godly Christian, a godly follower of Jesus. There are principles that we have to hang on to and, and, and really adhere to so that we can be people after God's heart. We, there's a few things. One is we need to be quick to forgive. If we're going to receive from God, we're going to hear from God, we're going to honor God the right way, we're going to have good hearts before God, we need to be quick to forgive. Now, that is not taught in the world. Forgiveness is earned. Forgiveness is if, if I'm feeling like it, if, if, if it strikes me right, right? But not in the kingdom. Forgiveness is given regardless of whether they're even repentant or not. Whether they apologized or said sorry makes no difference whatsoever. We forgive because he first forgave us. That's why we forgive, period. And if you want to be a person after God's heart, if you want to receive from God, if you want to hear from God, we got to be quick to forgive. Quick to forgive. Are you following me? We also need to be quick to repent. When you make a mistake, don't don't hide that away. Come on, get that out. Get that into the light. Make it right. Repent. God, forgive me. Make it right with the person you wronged. Make it right. Be quick. Be quick. This, this, is, this is the quality of a mature Christian who recognizes God inside of them and says, I'm forgiven. Whether I feel like it or not, I'm forgiving. I'm letting that go because I've been forgiven a much. And I've made a mistake, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repent. I'm asking for forgiveness. Come on. It's, it's being quick. Quick to forgive. Quick to repent. Yes? It's important. Yeah? It's important. It's important. Quick to forgive. Quick to repent. Quick to believe. When you hear something from God, when you hear something from the word of God, be quick to believe it. I don't mean you're, I don't mean you're rushing through something you can't prove in the word, but I'm saying when you see it, when the Holy Spirit reveals it to you and it comes alive, just accept it. Receive it. 
when you want you want to get things from God, you want to hear from God, you want to have a heart after God, man, when he talks to you, receive it, believe it. Amen. So he's washing feet. When you in this culture, when you bathe, you're clean, you're washed, right? Everything's but they didn't have asphalt. They didn't have sidewalks. There were no paving crews. When you had to go anywhere in sandals, right? They weren't timberline boots, right? White's custom made, you know, keep your feet clean. Sandals. That's what they had. So when you go anywhere, your feet are dirty. And it was customary it was culture. You come into somebody's house, there was usually a, a base in there where you could rinse your feet off. Take your shoes off, rinse your feet off. And you could come in without tracking your your road that you just walked down into the house every, all day long. So Jesus is showing them that he's taking care of this issue. And he said, what, J- Peter said, what, wash on, not only my feet, but my hands and my head. And Jesus said, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is, uh, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. He's making a reference to Judas. To Judas. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know why I have done, why I have done to you? Do you know what I have done to you? <clears throat> you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now, Jesus is, again, making an example, and he washed his disciples' feet. Now, we know there's 12 disciples, right? He washed all of their feet, including, including Judas, including Judas. And he knows who's going to betray him now. So this is where we're going to backpedal into Judas just a little bit. Can we do that? Judas would have outshouted you at one of Jesus' meetings in the beginning. Come on, he was one of the 12. He was excited about what Jesus was doing. He was excited to see that Jesus was fulfilling prophecy in front of their eyes. He was excited to see that Jesus is the Messiah. He, was, he had brothers in arms, 11 other disciples with him that they were serving and working together and, and going after the things of God. Come on, this is, this is someone that Jesus picked after praying all night. This was not a light decision. Jesus handpicked his disciples. And by all accounts, Judas was doing well. Because I don't know how you ha- who you have in your family, but you don't give us... Uh, Slippery finger, Uncle Joe, all the money box to the family treasury. Right? Who you trust with the money, the inheritance, the, the funds is somebody that's trustworthy. Are you following me? I mean, he got that job for a reason. Probably business savvy, probably understood some things, was good with money. And he was excited. He was in. He was all in. He had left behind his old life, and now he's following Jesus. And he's in charge. Of the money box. So what we kind of touched on last week a little bit this week is, is how did Judas go from avid disciple and follower of Jesus to now he's thieving and eventually gets to a place where he allows Satan into his life to control him to betray Jesus? How did he get there? It's not a complicated answer. It's just a five-letter word. M-O-N-E-Y, money, money got him, money got him. Are you guys, are you guys okay with this? This, you know, this is tying back to what I said a little bit earlier about why, why do we get upset when God blesses people? Why would that even bother us that God would do something extraordinary and nice to someone else? Why, why would we get upset when a ministry gets a jet that preaches the gospel all over the world? Why would that bother us? Isn't it better and more exciting to believe that that's a tool that's reaching the lost in a way we can't? You know what I mean? We get in our little bubble, and what we're, what we're telling on ourselves is this. We're saying the money is more important than the people. I figured it'd be about that quiet. <laughs> people 
people are always more important than money. And how God does things to get the gospel to people is none of our business. We're supposed to follow God for us. That's it. And he tells people to sow into things that make most Christians scratch their head. Why would you do that? They don't need it. Look at what they drive. Look at what they live in. Look at what they're doing already. They got plenty. To him who has, more will be given. Who said that? Red letters. Red letters. You think heaven's socialist? You're going to be shocked. Shocked. This is a work and tier system. This is a faithfulness tier system. Our faithfulness here matters for eternity. So pay attention to what you're doing for the kingdom because it matters. Judas got tripped up on money. Now listen to me. This is the part that, that should be a little bit eye-opening and, and maybe in a, in a godly way scary to us. I don't mean like terror, but I mean like godly reverential fear. If Judas can fall away from Jesus while he's walking with him on the planet with money, how much easier is it for Christians? The Bible says in the last days there's going to be a falling away. People that do not really know God, that are not really following God, and even those that are are going to be drawn away by the lights and the glitter of the world. We're seeing it all over the place. Former Christian soloists and churches going to the limelight of Hollywood, laying, laying aside their religion, their tradition, everything that they were taught. Why? For glitz, for glamour, for money. But it's not just the big ones. What I'm, what I'm talking about is a church full of folks that love God that are here in church this morning on Sunday. What are we allowing to get in the way of our, our destiny with Jesus? Where have we stopped obeying because we needed to hang on to stuff that we worked for? I earned that. That's hard-earned money. It took me a long time to get the education, to get to the promotion, to get to the bonus. And now God wants me to do what with it? Come on now, this is how Judas, that's how, he, that's how it started, a little bit at a time. You think about him. He had to justify this in some way, shape, or form. He's got the money box. He's skimming from the treasury of the ministry. How do you get to that place? You have to justify it a little bit at a time. You know, I worked a little bit extra this week. I was watching. I was watching. I did more. I, did, I was out longer. I was up earlier. You know. Somebody's got to be thinking about retirement in this place. I mean, come on now. I mean, I don't see no 401k on the ticket here. I mean, somebody has got to put something aside. Somebody's paying attention to the money. here. I mean, you know, just a little bit here, just taking care of a little extra thing. It'll be fine. I mean, you know, Jesus, you know, he may not be around forever, so we got to make sure. I mean, I gave up everything for this. So, I mean, it, I got to get a little something extra. I mean, what if this whole thing ends tomorrow? I mean, they're talking about killing him all the time. We're not even going to Jerusalem because they want to. If he dies tomorrow, what are we going to do? A little bit of time. A little bit of time. And then Satan tempted him. He's already put it in his heart to betray Jesus. Go over to Matthew 26 real quick. Can you take a little more? Are you guys okay? Is this too hard? All right. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 26. Verse 6, and when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon Peter, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. This sounds familiar. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. Two different perspectives, two different things going on. We see her anoint his feet in John. That's how John told it, right? And this one, Matthew's telling it, oh, he anointed more than her feet, more than his, she anointed more than his feet. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? Judas came up with the phrase, why are we not selling this and giving it? And they, the disciples were carried away with that thought process. John just puts it all on Judas, but Matthew sees another perspective from the Holy Spirit that the others were carried away with this madness. Why are we doing this? We could have sold this. See how easy it is when somebody says something? Why does that preacher need a car? Why does he need that nice of a car? He could drive a Hyundai. They get to the same place. They both have air conditioning, power steering. 
You see how this, the enemy creeps in? I mean, Christ, Christians and believers are not supposed to be the poorest people on the planet. We, when, if we came to God, God in that state, he will get us out. I mean, I could spend three hours telling you stories about people in different countries that were in the poorest of the poorest conditions and found the gospel and found out God wants them well and healed and delivered and prosperous and living for him. And they believed God, and as they obeyed him, God increased them. And the more he increased them, the more they did for him. And the more he increased them, the more they did for him. Are you following me? God is the God of increase. He's into multiplication and addition, not division and subtraction. So the disciples get carried away with this. He could have given this to the poor. Jesus was aware of it. He said, why do you trouble the woman? For she's done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil out on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? This was the tipping point for Judas. He was like, that oil wasn't salvageable. It was poured out. Couldn't capture it, couldn't regather it, couldn't sell it, couldn't skim from it. Are you following me? Just this, he, had, he was so wrapped up in what he could get. He wasn't concerned about the poor at this point. He was concerned about his skimming. His percentage is getting cut into his retirement plan. We, I, that, was a, that was a payday. That was a year's wage. I could have skimmed a nice chunk from that. And when Jesus rebukes him and says, this was for me. She saved this for me. This was an honor to me. He didn't care about honoring Jesus. He didn't care about honoring Jesus. That wasn't in his thought. He cared about the man. Are you following me? Because of that instance, now he's going to the chief priest and he's saying, what will you give me? 30 pieces of silver was not a big deal. It was, a, it was the going wage to buy a, just a, a run-of-the-mill ordinary slave. It was not massive wages. That was, that was the going rate. That's what they offered him. And it fulfilled prophecy from the Old Testament, which I'm assuming he did not know of at the time, that he would betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But he went and he said, I'll betray him for that. It was so little. It was so little. Here's the point I want to make. Jesus is offering everything to us. Everything to us. He, he gave up who he was, his place, his position, came down, humbled himself, became a human being, a man. And, and this is not just for the time he was here. He will forever be a glorified human body as the resurrected Lord. Because when we see him, we will look just like him. Are you following me? Eyes and ears and legs and arms. I mean, he laid down some stuff. But he gained a whole bunch of more after. But he did all that. He laid down everything. God gave his precious, most precious gift, his son, his only begotten, for us. That is love tangible to us. And Judas is willing to cast it all aside for a little bit of money. It's trading such a big price for such a little reward. And it's God's love, the contrast between God's love and how the enemy operates. He's always getting us and trying to get us to trade what's invaluable for just worthless stuff. And we forget because we get our eyes on this world. We get our eyes on the grind. We get our eyes on the rat race. We get our eyes on just getting it done and getting to retirement and paying the bills. And we forget that there's a bigger price paid for us. And there's a whole bunch of people, people that say they love God, are trading money and stuff for the things of God. And it's a worthless trade. Right? I mean, if you could go back and just shake Judah, what are you doing? Prophecy had to be fulfilled, but Judas still had a choice. Judas still had a choice. He chose money over Jesus. And so we look at that as an extreme, going, I'd never do that, and yet we have. We have done it. We have done it. We've chosen comfort sometimes. We've chosen jobs over following the Lord. We've chosen churches over following the Lord. Are you hearing me? Like, it pays to follow God, and sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes we've got to let go of something that we're supposed to let go of. But man, is it worth it to just see what we're, where we're heading. Faithfulness is reward. Faithfulness is what's rewarded in heaven. Faithfulness is what's rewarded down here, on the ground while we're still around. God is paying attention. They will, we will, he will open the books in front of us, and we will give an account. 
Let it not be said that we chose and traded money. We traded stuff. We traded comfort. We traded this world's goods for what he's asked us to do. If anything he's asked you to lay down or give up, that's not forever. Come on, that's just a, that's just a moment. He's never asking us to get stuff from us. He's always asking us to get stuff to us. But he can't get stuff to us sometimes when we're holding on to what he's, what, what's already in front of us. He's like, if you'll just let that go, I'll give you something better. Are you hearing me? So Judas got there a little bit by little bit until he finally, while dipping bread with Jesus, he's in there and he's in that meeting. He's in that, that company of Jesus while Jesus is washing feet and he's feeding his disciples and he's sharing with them and he's loving on them and he's, and he's showing them what it looks like to serve the people. Judas is there in hypocrisy. He's there with a lion smile and lion eyes because he knows he's about what he's about to do. And Jesus said, whoever, whoever eats this bread after I dip it, he's the one that will betray me. And after Jesus dips the bread and he gives it to Judas and Judas eats it in hypocrisy, the Bible says that Satan entered him and he went and he did what he did. See, we've got to be real careful that we're being real with people, being real with where we're at. That includes your job. Come on, taking a paycheck, using the benefits of working for somebody, talking bad about them behind their back. How's that any different? Come on, we gotta, we got to pay attention. What, how are we in ways like this? How are we acting like this and not seeing this? Right? Being real. Being there in the, for the right reasons. If, if you don't agree with people, if you don't agree with the job, if you don't agree at how it's running, find a different job. But don't take a paycheck and talk bad about them behind their back. You're going, over, going over super good, right? I'm hoping these are wheels turning, right? Like, we want to honor God with all of our lives, don't we? And all of our responses and how we live, we want him to look at our heart and see his goodness in there. And when it's not there, we need to trim it, prune it, bring light on it, recognize what we're doing and change it. For crying out loud, we don't want to get stuck and into a place where we can be tempted to step outside of the will of God and be led astray like Judas was, who was getting the best teaching with the best leader and the most loving Savior ever. And he still walked away from Jesus. The only hope we have is to stay close to Jesus and do it with a real heart and a true heart and continue to let him prune and and trim and help us and make adjustments because you are not perfect. You need to continue to change and adjust so that we can look more and more like him. You and I, right? Don't we? Don't we? Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you're doing. Sometimes tough pills to swallow when when we're reading your word. Sometimes we rah-rah, we get excited, we cheer. We get fired up, sometimes we read it, and the Holy Spirit just smacks us around a little bit. But we need that too. So Lord, speak to our hearts. Help us to hear from you, to be led by your Spirit. Lord, we don't want to be hypocrites at all. We want to be real. We want to follow you. We want to be genuine. Help us, Lord. Help us to see in ourselves the things that need to change. Holy Spirit, reveal to us the things we need to correct and make right. Lord, let us be quick to forgive, quick to repent, and quick to believe. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We want to honor you. We want to see others be blessed and be excited for them. Thank you, Father. Help us to follow you. Better and better every day. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to make an invitation to anybody here from the sound of my voice. If you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, one of the biggest decisions, the biggest decision you will ever make in your life is making Jesus Lord of your life. The Bible says this, that if you will believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you will confess him as your Lord and your Savior, Savior, and you'll believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. You'll be born again. You'll be brand new. So in a minute, all of us, our whole church family, we're going to pray this prayer. We're going to pray a prayer that says yes to Jesus. We're going to pray a prayer that says, I believe this. In my heart, I'm confessing it with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. And not only Lord, but he's my Lord. So we're going to we're gonna all pray this prayer, all of us together. So this is what I'm asking you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you want to be included in this prayer, you're going to say, yeah, Corey, I'm going to pray this prayer with the whole church today. I'm acknowledging Jesus as my Lord and Savior 
you want to do that, maybe for the first time, or maybe you want to rededicate, give your heart to the Lord again. You walked away, you stepped away, you want to recommit to him, you want to say yes to him. Come on, this is your hour, this is your day, this is your moment. Don't let this slip by. Be real with God. He loves you. He died for you. He's got good plans for you. But it starts with you saying yes to him. So here's the invitation. Nobody's looking around, just me. So between you, me, and Jesus, this is what I'm asking. You're acknowledging that you're going to pray this prayer with us. I'm asking you to either make eye contact with me or to just flip your hand up where I can see it. And then we're going to all pray this prayer together. God's going to do something brand new in you. So I'm going to look around for just a minute. Thank you, Lord. Doing something good in this place. Thank you, Lord. Do it online. I see that hand. Anybody else? Saying, yes, Jesus, I want you. Come into my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I see those eyes. Anybody else? faithful. He's good. He's true. Thank you. Let's pray this prayer together. Can we do that? Mean it from your heart. Confess it with your mouth. Amen. Pray this after me. Father God, I believe Jesus is Lord. He is your son. He came to the earth. He died for my sins. And God, you raised him from the dead. Jesus, I'm asking you, come into my life. Be my savior. And my Lord, forgive me of all my sin and make me brand new. Fill me with your peace, with your joy, and with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Come on, you prayed that prayer. God did something brand new. Amen.